Hello and welcome back. This is Tyler from Today's Passion. Today I want to do a video about a cool piece of technology and introduce the Harvest Right freeze dryer to you guys. So the agenda for today's video, it's going to start with a quick overview of what the machine does. Then I'll move into how it works as best that I can articulate to you guys. And then we'll transition to uh, why I think that may be useful for you. And then we'll move over to the parts involved. If you were wanting to buy this from the manufacturer and there's some options that you can choose to customize it to your, your wants and needs, etc. And then lastly, I'll try to pull it all together and explain my opinion about why I think this machine is so important and valuable. I'll try to cover all this information relatively quickly. Uh, however, if you do want more information that's a little more specific and detailed, please drop me a comment below and I'll respond to that when I have a chance. So before I get into it, I did want to put a plug out there that if you have made it this far and you're willing to be patient with the quality of my videos, I wanted to ask that if you could please subscribe or like on this video, it sure would have uh, mean a lot to me and I really appreciate it. As every other content creator on YouTube will tell you, and I'm quickly finding out to be true myself, it really does help this channel to grow, and I honestly do find it very encouraging to get your feedback and appreciate all of the encouragement that you guys give me to keep this fledgling channel growing. So without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, so I've described my situation plenty. Let's dig into this machine. The unit we're looking at here is a medium Harvest Right freeze dryer. Uh, if you're not familiar with freeze drying, think about Mountain House or even astronaut food. Um, they primarily do a lot of freeze drying, but they also incorporate some gels and stuff. So I'm not saying it's all, all freeze dried food, but they do have some in there uh, just because it saves on weight and it's already prepared and ready to eat. So the whole appliance is comprised of this main unit right here. It has the brains. Um, I refer to it as kind of like a motherboard and a PC kind of thing. It's got this touch screen and it has all these, you can hit this little icon right here and you can move through the settings and it'll kind of walk you through the prompts uh, so you can kind of understand a little bit better how you're adjusting the settings. Um, it has a condenser. You can see on the side here, it's kind of a blue coil. Uh, it's got a condenser for freezing. So when I say freezing, it gets minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit and colder. Uh, and you see these little orange things right here, these orange mats? Those are the heater elements, so the trays are sitting on top of it. So those are the heater elements, Dave. I think, I think I've seen those go upwards of 155 degrees Fahrenheit or more. Um, also in this main unit right here is the tray holder system. We'll go ahead and open this up. This is, this is the door, obviously. Go right there. So this whole system is the tray holder assembly. Um, it's got a wire harness in the back of it, so you can pull this whole thing out. You take this little gasket, this rubber gasket off, and then you can slide this whole thing out, and there's a little clip that just undoes from the unit itself, so you can take the tray holder system out and clean it by hand. No dishwashers because of this foil wrap, and the heater elements are probably glued some way or another to the underside to heat the tray, so you don't want to mess with it. And it's got an electrical plug on the back for plugging into the unit, so... Don't try doing a, a dishwasher or anything. Just wash it with soap and water and call it a good day. Um, then you can put it back in, obviously. So the big key part here is whenever you're you're putting this in, you get it clicked back into its little adapter. You put this gasket on, but I try not to put it on all the way because you'll push it on too tight. When you close this super thick epoxy door, you want to see that gasket touch all the way around right here, and if you don't, well, I have this screwdriver over here so I can pull the gasket out around the edge and that helps get a good seal before the pump kicks on. And then when the pump kicks on, it sucks this in hardcore and then you'll see this fat, thick black line where it, it's compressed against the rubber gasket, probably, probably a half inch thick black line. It's a lot of force on the pump. So also you'll see this valve right here. This comes out of the back of the unit. That's the side of the unit. Um, what this does is this also, it's open right now because it's parallel with the line, but when, if you turn this sideways and it's perpendicular to the line, it actually seals the air off from the unit. So when the pump is on, anytime you're running this machine, you want to try to make sure that is closed. So perpendicular. Um, the only exception would be is 
I think it's probably specific to my pump I have now, but um, it exhausts any kind of water at the end of a cycle and it recommends you keep this open at that point. So this is closed. This is so you can get a good suction inside when the, the pump is kicked on so you can get that sublimation process. This is open. And so also what this does at the end of your cycle, your batch, uh, you'll have to defrost the drum on the inside. You can do that manually or you can have the machine itself automatically do it. It's a lot faster to do it with the machine. The heaters will kick on and then they'll start melting that ice, that, that thick layer of ice that's formed around the drum. Uh, I think my machine takes about three hours and after the three hours, there's still chunks of ice in there, but you can pull it out by hand, clean it out real quick and then put another load in. If you don't do the, the, the heater defrost mechanism inside with the, the tray heaters, I'd probably plan on a day and a half or more to thaw out enough to, re to where you can pull out the ice chunks. So when it melts, it drains right here. This tube goes down underneath and into a bucket. Uh, you want to make sure if you're doing a, a couple cycles at one time, that hose is not in water. Because if you just ran a cycle and you pop this open, it's going to pull a ton of air. And if that hose is in water, it's going to pull all that water back into the unit. And that water is going to get drawn from the bucket into the machine, the drum, and then into your pump. And then you could be, you could have a lot of damage to the internals of your pump. Okay, so here's the other side of the freeze dryer just coming down. You'll see this clear hose right here. It goes down. And below here is the their higher end pump, vacuum pump. I think it's called a scroll pump, but it's they, they call it the oilless pump. Um, I chose this because it's maintenance free essentially. You don't have to change the oil or check settings or do anything like that. You just run it, it takes care of itself, and it has for the last three years. Um, I don't believe I'm in the warranty anymore. I think I still have a partial warranty, but not a full warranty. But anyway, so that clear hose, it connects to the side of your drum up top, and then it comes down, and then it connects to your pump, and that's how it pulls the air out of it. It also has this plug right here that actually plugs right into the back of your main unit up top. So you can see this little pool, because I just finished running uh, a full gallon of milk, um, it inevitably ends up getting moisture inside of it. So at the end of your cycle, the pump will kick on and exhaust for five minutes and it'll automatically kick out whatever water is inside your pump out of this little thing right here. It's still dry. Um, so yeah, that's the, the other main piece of this whole appliance. You got the main unit up top and then you got the pump. So those, those are the main components to it. The other components are more minor, but they're also important in the end product. You got your Mylar bags. Uh, you do get a bunch of Mylar bags from Harvest Right, and they also give you some oxygen absorbers, I believe. But I went ahead and stocked up on a bunch of different sizes of Mylar bags. I just broke into the ones that Harvest Right gives me. Um, I will say their bags seem top notch, but they are they seem a thicker a thicker gauge or a thicker thickness i guess of mylar i always use the the half mil and i think these might be 0.7 um, but they seem to be harder to to get the seal at least with me um, and how i'm doing it but maybe it's not consistent maybe it's just my problem so that's a lot of the stuff that goes into here i'll pan over here now and show you the sealer that also comes so this sealer it's called an impulse sealer from harvest right it's a uh, it's very awesome. It, it seals super fast. You just plug it in. You adjust this little dial right here. So if you're running some thick bags, thick mylar, you want to keep it all the way pegged to the top. If you're running thinner bags or uh, like a food saver bag or something, um, you want to adjust this dial. Otherwise, it'll just melt clean through the bag. So you adjust the setting. You just push the bag in there. Push that down. You'll hear a click. You're done. Easy peasy. So those are the main components of the freeze dryer. Now I'm gonna talk about how it works, the process, and the end product you get. To wrap up this section, I'll go over some packaging options and what I do most. So how this hefty piece of machinery works is through a process called sublimation. So in a nutshell, this process 
cools a substance down, creates a powerful vacuum, and slowly heats and cools that substance. This process allows the water, let's just say a liquid, in the trays to go from solid states to gas states and skip the whole liquid state altogether. So I hope you're still tracking me. Um, so for example, I just finished running a, uh, a whole batch of milk. It's a full gallon of milk, uh, 2%. Uh, I won't go into the amounts of fat and sugar and oil and stuff that you got to kind of keep an eye out for. Uh, you could look into it if you're interested. Um, but yeah, I just did a 2% milk, a whole gallon in there. Fits all four trays perfectly. So, um, the freeze dryer cooled to below minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Then the pump kicked on and all the liquid in the solid form that's frozen in the trays was slowly warmed, then cooled repeatedly under that vacuum until the liquid in a solid state went straight to a gas and condensed along the metal drum. Right here. This drum all the way around. All the way around. So it gets pulled out of the food and the vacuum pulls it to the rim of the drum where it condenses and re-solidifies. So it skips that whole liquid state. Solid to gas, back to solid. It's pretty amazing. Uh, and then it just creates a solid chunk of ice along the edge. Okay, so you're ready to go. You load your food into the, the tray holders and you hit continue because once you hit that start for pre-freezing 15 minutes, it'll pop open the thing, open the door. It'll make sure your side valve is closed and you'll load your food in and then it'll say continue and then it'll remind you to check that valve. So when you close this door, again, you're going to want to make sure you see that black line all the way around ensuring that there's a, a tight seal. I don't know if it makes a huge difference, but I'm kind of anal and I think that if I'm trying to cool that chamber inside and I don't see that connecting black line in parts like up here from here to here there's no black line I'm thinking there's hot air able to get in and that cold air is also able to get out maybe that's just me maybe you'll need to worry about it but I tend to worry about it so I'm just referencing it for you guys okay so you close that up get a good seal you hit continue and it'll continue freezing uh, I think the freeze cycle is possibly eight to ten hours and I think it needs to kind of get down to minus 20 or colder uh, Fahrenheit uh, at least that's how I've kind of observed it it seems to take a long time for liquids unless they're pre-frozen the machine doesn't necessarily tell you or give you an option for pre-frozen or not frozen and older uh, prior uh, I don't know what you call it firmwares or whatever you um, system updates, they used to give you a prompt for either selecting a pre-frozen, which would speed the process up, or not frozen. Uh, they don't give that give that to you anymore, so I'm assuming it doesn't matter. But anyway, uh, it'll freeze until, let's say, 10 hours, and it reaches maybe minus 25 uh, Fahrenheit. Then the pump will kick on, and it'll run for several hours, and you'll see, uh, this cycle is called the dry cycle, and you'll see a bar that progresses to the right. This bar will be right here. Sorry, I don't want to see my face that much. Uh, this bar will be right here and then it'll, it'll go all the way across the screen. There'll be a little orange color that kind of progresses all the way across the screen. It's kind of funky in the sense that it doesn't tell you like a countdown until the process is done. It just tells you how long the process has been going. So it's fully automated. There's a ton of sensors in here that read the moisture content, the temperature, and all that kind of stuff. And it'll kind of, you'll see that bar bounce around back and forth as it's constantly reevaluating how far along it is. So it's wonky in the sense that you don't, you don't necessarily have an idea on how long it's going to take. You just got to watch that bar. So it dries. Let's just say it dries for 10 hours. Um, then you have this option. For extra dry time, I have defaulted my extra dry time, my extra dry time, for nine hours, and I do that kind of as a safety precaution because uh, this runs for a long period, often over 24 hours, sometimes 50 hours, depending on what you're running, um, and so it's running overnight, 
and there are times when it's running overnight and I'm I get up fairly early and I head to work pretty early and so if I don't remember to come out and check it the extra dry, dry time kind of covers me because I set it for nine hours so it covers my shift I get home say hi to the family I run out here and try to get everything packaged works perfect you don't have to let it run for the extra dry time uh, but in my opinion it doesn't hurt because you're just trying to double check and ensure that the machine has actually found every little piece of moisture in that food or liquid that you were putting in there prior to freeze drying and that it gets rid of it. Um, so you can use it as a safety caution, precaution like I do just, just so you can go to work with a little peace of mind and not worry about if it's done in the middle of the day. But uh, it's up to you. So... Um, It'll kind of, I think it maintains the, or not think, it does maintain the pump on, creating that draw, and it keeps it cold or warm, depending on the temperature that it's finally, that it's doing, because like I said, it alternates between hot and cold. Um, so it maintains whatever status it is until you basically hit the button on top in that screen, and then open the door. And you'll notice that whenever you're ready to open the, the door and check the food, you can't open it. Even when you hit the button and the pump kind of shuts off or stalls out, you have to go over to the side and release that valve, that, that, that valve on the side. You'll hear a big shh as it's sucking in all that air, but it's creating such a powerful suction, there's no way you're going to get this door open. And if you did, you broke something probably. So don't try it. Just make sure you release the pressure and then the door will be really easy to open. And then you can check your food and make sure that it's good to go. It should be 100% moisture free, should be very light. The trays should be warm. Uh, one of uh, a double precaution that I have is I have this IR gun that I shine through to check the temperatures on all the trays. And usually if they're over 70 degrees, I call it good. Um, oftentimes it seems like this top tray, it'll be the last one to hit above 70 degrees for some reason. Um, so usually I'll wait until this top tray hits somewhere around 70. Usually these will all be between 73 and 75, and that's good. You want it to be warm to touch. If it's cold, then you know there's still moisture in it. That's the key thing, key takeaway out of this is if the food feels cold, it's, it's still frozen, and it didn't sublimate the moisture out, out of it yet. So uh, again, 70 is kind of that number that I look for, and I use this to tell me if the food, and I shine it all around, and see what everything looks like. All right, making progress. Next topic, wanna to discuss why the machine is useful, at least why I think the machine is useful. First topic is the garden. If any of you are familiar with growing a garden and how all of a sudden one weekend, all of this one crop is ready for harvest. Oftentimes we're scrambling trying to figure out what we wanted to do with all of this stuff, how are we gonna store it, do we even have space for storing it? Do we have to throw out more stuff to put this new stuff in? It's a mess sometimes. Um, so another perfect example why a freeze dryer is amazing. Um, you can cook some fresh produce, you could freeze some fresh produce, you could can some fresh produce, and you can freeze dry some produce. And then when you reconstitute it and add more water back later when you want to eat it, it tastes just like it's fresh. It's amazing. Next next reason why I think uh, it's useful is say you're catching a sale at the grocery store. Um, oftentimes, I, I think, uh, when we go to the grocery store, my wife is fantastic at this, by the way. She is the coupon queen, catching the sales. Um, I love her for it. But um, oftentimes when we go to the store and we catch a sale, we usually tend to buy maybe one or two more of those items just in case or just because it's on sale. So what do we do with all those extra items that we weren't planning or needing for a meal today or tomorrow? Oftentimes it goes in the freezer. Well, what do you do when an item's in the freezer? You gotta pay electricity for the months or however long that you're storing it in that freezer. That's one of my big problems with a freezer. I'm pretty uptight and anal when it comes to just frivolously spending electricity. And I get a freezer is almost a necessity nowadays in, in some families. It is in ours because we just don't have enough refrigerator and, and freezer space in the house. But um, that's just another perfect example of why a freeze dryer, freeze dryer comes in handy. Um, you can freeze stuff, but you can also freeze dry stuff. So you're not taking your whole fridge up 
or your whole freezer up with corn or carrots or whatever the crop is you produce that you just got a, a bountiful crop. So another example, a personal example I have that I kind of just recently discovered was uh, my son is an extremely picky eater. He is the worst at eating and we just kind of happened across the fact that he likes yogurt bites. Uh, so there's little dollops of yogurt. Um, we'll just kind of squirt those on the trays, put them in the freeze dryer, and they're done pretty quickly because they're small. Uh, there's a lot of airspace around it, so it's an easy, quick, simple load. Um, and my son loves them. And, you know, it's Greek yogurt with a little bit of flavor, a little bit of sugar, but it's protein, they're nutritious, and they're shelf-stable. You don't have to worry about freezing the yogurt or putting it in the fridge. You can keep it on the counter. And that's oftentimes what we do because they are very tasty. And so we'll put them in a, like a ball jar with an oxygen absorber and put the lid on really tight. And we'll just eat out of that jar whenever we want a snack or whenever we're having a meal and he wants something different. We'll give him a few of those kind of things. So um, that's another perfect example. And then the last example I have, I didn't want to have this laundry list of examples. There are many reasons and opportunities why a freeze dryer would be useful, but this last one that I have, I already kind of touched on what the picky toddler thing is. Um, the greatest longevity of uh, food quality. I mean, think of any other way to store food. Canning, what's that, 18 months maybe? The fridge, maybe a week or two. Uh, the freezer, maybe six months, maybe you push it more depending on what it is. So what are, what are you left with? Freeze drying. Uh, you could dehydrate food, but there goes your nutritional value. So freeze drying is almost the best alternative for it because um, you're, you're maintaining your nutritional quality, you're not damaging cell structure, and it's shelf stable. All right, next topic. Only two more topics left, and I just wanna say that thank you for whoever has stuck around this long. I sure hope somebody sticks around for the entire length of the video, but this is significantly longer than I intended to be. I was thinking maybe 10 to 15 minutes, and I think we're already cresting 22 minutes. So I'll try to run through this last piece, a uh, couple pieces pretty quickly. So the next thing I want to talk about is options from the manufacturer, Harvest Right. I just checked these prices and options this morning. So everything's legitimate up until it's not. and. I just saw this morning that uh, they used to have three options for pumps. They only have two now. So again, things are changing. I don't know if that's due to things in the world and the economy nowadays, but maybe. So anyway, so there's three different size freeze dryers. Mine that we just looked at and toured was a medium. Um, a medium nowadays for four trays, it runs $3,195. If you get a Premier pump, which is an oil pump, which means there are maintenance responsibilities to change the oil, the cost of the pump is included. Uh, if you get the oil-free pump like I have, that's an additional $1,500 on top of whatever price for the, the main unit. So keep that in mind. In my opinion, I think it's worth it because if you're running cycles often, running batches often like I am, the month of November has almost been nonstop in my house. So, I mean, we've been pumping through gallons of milk, yogurt, all kinds of stuff. And it's great. I mean, that's the point of it. That's why we got it. So, I'm glad it's running. It's just, if you're if you're running that many batches, I think we probably did 12 batches maybe. Maybe 13 batches so far this month. I think they say on average 25 batches and you have to do an oil change. So... Just remember there's a little more components needed for the oil change it takes more time in between being able to do another load um, to me peace of mind less maintenance less hassle i'm all about it i like the oil free pump so i talked about the price of the medium the small unit so my medium is four trays the smallest three trays that's twenty five hundred dollars and the pumps of course if you went with the oil pump it's included in that price oil free more expensive, $1,500. And lastly, the large uh, freeze dryer, that's five trays. It's $3,800, $3, basically $3,900. And that one's kind of specific. That one requires a dedicated 20 amp service. So if you look at your receptacle, they usually have a 15 or 20 amp 
it needs to be a dedicated 20 amp that's not tied to another outlet. So when I had my shop built and I had everything wired, even though mine's medium, uh, the, the manufacturer recommends the medium have a dedicated 20 amp, but it's not required. So it can still operate with a 15 amp, um, but I don't want to take a risk. So, and then the, the, the small doesn't, basically just your normal house outlet will work fine. The big issue is the pump on and off, on and off. Um, that requires a lot of energy as most large things are uh, kicking on and off. There's usually a big spike in energy draw and then it kind of plateaus and levels off. So that's the big thing with those. Two different pump options. Again, they used to be a third. Uh, seems like it's no longer available, which is easier choice, it seems like. And it seems like, uh, so I didn't, I didn't write down the prices for today. So these are the normal prices based on the website, but on their website, it looks like everything is heavily discounted for the time being. So, hey, if you're, if you got some money in your pocket burning a hole, why not set yourself up and your family for being a little prepared in case of a rainy day kind of thing. So my last topic I wanted to cover is kind of based on that, a rainy day fund. So uh, in my opinion, this is strictly my opinion. Feel free to tune it out. If you don't care about opinions, sometimes I don't either. I get it. But I just wanted to throw this in there at the last so people can be aware of it. But in my personal opinion, I do think the economy, our country, the world, there are a lot of unknowns. There are a lot of scary potential things happening in the world. I like to be more self-sufficient and less relying on other people. My personal preference. I don't live in the city. I live rural. We have property. We have some good folks around us, some good neighbors. But we're kind of isolated, geographically isolated. In the winter, it's hard to get over the mountains, the Cascades, and get over to here to us. So uh, sometimes the trucks don't come. <laughs> So, uh, in my opinion, it's usually err on the side of cautionary and have some more set aside for a rainy day. Our grandparents and our great grandparents always grew up with that philosophy and I don't see why there's a need for us to break away from that tradition. I think it's just as needed, just as required as it was back turn of the century. So, uh, that's all I got. I appreciate everybody that stuck through till the end. Uh, please like and subscribe if you haven't. If you don't, that's fine. I hope you stick around and periodically check in to see how the video quality, maybe my speaking ability, maybe me not dancing around the screen so much, all that. I hope you come back at some point and see how things are progressing. Hopefully for the better. I do anticipate they will. Hopefully sooner than later. But. Thank you again for your time. I sure appreciate it, everybody. Um, have a blessed day.